Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Sustainability Merit Badge. Uh, my name is Nicholas Anderson, and I will be your counselor for the day. As you can see there on the bottom left, there's a picture of me. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll start with change. I like to call this class Changing the World 101. Uh, I may not feel that way right now, but trust me, hopefully we'll get, get into it a little bit and uh, you'll see it through my eyes. So a good quote to start with is a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So sometimes sustainability can feel like a, a huge undertaking, but every single step, as we'll talk about in this presentation, will make a difference and will lead us on our journey. So a little bit about me to get started. Uh, my name is Nicholas. As I said in the beginning, I'm a junior mechanical engineer here at the University of Dayton. Right now, I am interning at an energy efficiency company called Weibel Energy Systems. I was inspired kind of in vein of sustainability by Philmont and Northern Tier. If any of you have been, uh, you probably know what I mean. Um, spending time in nature and Philmont hiking and at Northern Tier in the lakes of Canada is definitely inspiring to me to keep the world as beautiful as it was where I saw it there. Some of my interests. I'm a runner, mostly half marathons. I like backpacking, also inspired a little bit by Philmont. I enjoy road biking. I enjoy goats, although I don't have any. And then of course my co-op with Weibel Energy Systems. So we're just gonna jump right in here. Um, we're gonna start off with requirement one. So in your own words, I want you to answer what is sustainability? This can be maybe one or two sentences is you'll see on the Google form if you have that pulled up right now as well. Um, I will ask you to pause the video right now, take a couple minutes and answer what is sustainability in your own words. So I hope you got a chance to pause the video and answer what is sustainability. Uh, we'll get a chance to talk about that here in just a minute. So next I would like you to also write down uh, how do conservation and stewardship of our natural resources relate to sustainability. So this one might be a little more challenging, but hopefully in one or two sentences, you can briefly describe maybe what you think conservation and stewardship mean, and then how the, those um, actions can help uh, our natural resources relate to sustainability. So pause your video here and take a couple minutes to answer that. All right, so hopefully you got those written down in the Google form. And now we will get the EPA definition of sustainability. So they define it as the ability to maintain or improve standards of living without damaging or depleting natural resources for present and future generations. So this is kind of the overarching concept that we will be analyzing and looking at today throughout the presentation. So a little preview of what we're going to talk about today. Um, we're going to discuss the following sustainability topics. And for this presentation, we will probably get through water, food, and maybe get into community a little bit. So starting off with water, we are going to talk about how it gets to your house and then and kind of where it goes from there. So I'm going to pull up this video. Now, this is not uh, a specific video to maybe where you live, but the general idea of how the water gets from the sky to your home and back out is, is pretty much the same across the board. Has finally made an Every day, hundreds of dedicated EPCOR employees work to keep your lights on and your water flowing. And this is how they do it. Water's journey to your tap starts further back than you may expect. It begins in the heart of the Canadian Rockies. Glaciers, upper basin snowpack, and groundwater are the primary water sources for the North Saskatchewan River. Our river travels through forests, foothills, and farmland before finally reaching Edmonton and EPCOR's E.L. Smith and Rossdale water treatment plants. Water is brought into the treatment plant by pipes located deep in the river that are specially designed to protect fish. The water enters the treatment process where it is clarified, filtered, and disinfected, making it safe for you and your family to use. Throughout this process, EPCOR employees are testing the water quality. In fact, our water quality specialists conduct over 100,000 tests a year. 
After about 7 to 15 hours of treatment, the safe and clean water is stored in reservoirs, where it's ready to travel through thousands of kilometers of underground pipes, so it's there when you turn on your tap, flush your toilet, or take a bath. And the water we treat is used for many things in our communities, not just in your home. It's used to water your garden, to fill your local pools, produce the food you eat, and protect you in case of a fire. Providing clean water is what keeps our communities happy and healthy. And summer, fall, winter, and spring, we're working to ensure you always have clean, safe, and great tasting water. But our job doesn't end at your taps. Every time you take a shower or flush the toilet, you send wastewater to EPCOR's Gold Bar Wastewater Treatment Plant. This innovative plant collects and treats both your wastewater and nature's stormwater, making sure it's safe to return back to the river. The wastewater passes through various treatment steps, including removing debris and contaminants and clarification. It's disinfected using high-intensity ultraviolet light, and then the clean water is returned to the river to re-enter the water cycle. It's important that the water we return is safe for us and the environment, so we can use it today and others can use it in the future. Providing water to our communities is a big job, and it's one we're proud of. Because it's not just about cool drinks and hot showers, it's about the people who enjoy them. People like you. EPCOR. Providing more. So hopefully that was a good little video to explain how the water gets from wherever it falls in the sky, or in this case from the mountains down all the way to your house, and then how it gets cleaned and then put back into the river or uh, whatever body of water it came from. So we're going to move on from that, and we are going to use that information to show how your household gets its clean water from a natural source and what happens with the water after you use it. So basically the goal of this is kind of turn that video into a diagram more or less. So if you can draw it out on an eight and a half by 11, or maybe if you printed out uh, the worksheets, you can do it along um, in the box or, or whatever, whatever mode you wanna to use to draw or design a water diagram. So be sure in that water diagram to include uh, water that goes down the drain in the kitchen, bathroom and laundry room. So wherever that heads to, and then also the runoff from watering the yard or washing the car as that sometimes can go to a different location. And then also if you could on that diagram, write down two ways to preserve your family's access to clean water in the future. So go ahead and Pause the video here, and then on the Google form, there is there should be a place to upload the file, which can just be a picture of your water diagram. Alrighty, so hopefully your water diagram is looking excellent, and hopefully it is uploaded to the Google form. I'm very much looking forward to taking a look at those. I always love some good artwork. All right, we'll move on. All right, so now we're going to brainstorm some ways to save water. So if you want to pause the video here uh, and brainstorm some ways to save water, feel free. I'm going to go through a couple now of ideas that I came up with. And then at the end, I'll ask you to come up with at least two more on the Google form. So here we go. Um, one way is leave the water off when brushing your teeth. I'm sure you've heard this one several times, but uh, it definitely saves water to not have it on whenever you don't need it. Taking shorter showers is definitely a simpler, a simple way to reduce water use. Obviously, <laughs> it's a little bit challenging, but sometimes sustainability is uncomfortable. Uh, the third way is what's called a rain barrel. So you can see a picture there in the bottom right of a rain barrel. So the way this works is when water falls, on your roof and it goes down the gutter, you can see uh, on the top going into the barrel, instead of it going to the ground and back to the streets, it will fill this rain barrel. And then as you can see, there's a spout on the bottom and that can be used to fill up something to water your plants or be used when you don't need purified water. So I think that's a really cool way to conserve water. And then uh, the fourth, this is a bit of an extreme story. So last summer or two summers ago now, 
I lived on a sustainability education farm and the way we conserved water, uh, they didn't have running water. So it, all the water they used was from the sky. And um, I showered more or less out of a bucket. It was a bucket in the ceiling that was heated by the sun. And then when the water got warm, uh, there was a spigot on the end and you could open and close it to get water out for a shower. So definitely extreme way to conserve water. But uh, so on your Google form, hopefully you can come up with at least two more ideas of ways to save water. So I'll go ahead and pause the video here and come up with a couple more ways of how you might be able to save water. All right, so hopefully you came up with at least two ideas, maybe even more. And uh, if any of them are really good, maybe I'll share them with my roommates and we can conserve some extra water. So this is kind of an interesting video. Uh, this is how the Boy Scouts conserve water. So this video is a little older, but if any of you went to, I think it's at the summit, um, you can see how they conserve water there. We heard you loud and clear from the 2010 Jamboree. You wanted permanent places to wash your hands, take a shower, and use the restroom. These are the first three of the permanent shower houses that are being built for the 2013 Jamboree. There's a lot of really special things about them. Each neighborhood of 10 troops is gonna share about three of these buildings. They're built from local hemlock, milled by a local mill, and we've got the most special thing in my mind is our gray water system. For the first time, you're gonna be able at the Jamboree to wash your hands. That water's gonna be treated and reused to flush the toilets and the urinals. And take a look at this. Each one uses a chain in order to conserve as much water as we possibly can. Because remember, we've got the gray water system recycling our water from washing our hands into our toilets and urinals, but the pool chain showers are just one more way that we can make sure that our impact is as small as possible. The shower houses have a really cool signage program. We've got men's and if we slide this panel over, we'd have women too. So we're ready for you venturers. So that's where the summit stands today. Check back with us in a couple weeks and we hope to have more great stories to share with you. All right, so I think that video is kind of a cool way to see how the Boy Scouts can serve water. Um, definitely takes a lot of uh, thought to realize that, you know, you don't need to that you're able really to reuse water that isn't totally, um, totally dirty. So now we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, food waste. So there's a couple ways mentioned on here of ways you can reduce food waste. So cooking and eating what you already have. I know for me, a lot of the times I will open the fridge and stare at it for a little while and say, oh, there's nothing to eat. When in reality, there's lots of things uh, in there, maybe some just take a little more effort to prepare. So cooking and eating what you already have is definitely a way to reduce food waste. Also, this is a big one, plan a menu before shopping. So not only going to the shopping store with a list of what you're going to buy, but also maybe some menu um, meal ideas before you have. So if you plan out your lunches and dinner, maybe for the week or however frequently you go shopping, um, that'll definitely help keep you on track for what you're buying and not buying anything extra it may even save you a little bit of money. Uh, the third way that I came up with is to freeze or preserve uneaten food. So um, freezing food can help it last a lot longer or uh, if you have some kind of um, sealing method to get the air out or anything like that, those can all um, help reduce your food waste and, and continue so you can keep eating that food that you worked so hard to cook. Uh, another way is composting. So we'll watch this short video um, kind of explaining how to create or start your own compost bin or pile. Ohio homeowners, if you have a power meter like Sorry this on the side of your house, you can qualify to e- This episode of D News is brought to you 
great for the environment. So what is compost? In a nutshell, it is a collection of organic waste, aka food and plants, that decomposes over several months and eventually turns into humus, which is an extremely nutrient-rich soil. What's special about it is that in addition to eliminating unnecessary landfill waste, the soil it produces can also be used as an organic fertilizer for your home garden. So all composting requires is three basic ingredients. You need water and you need an equal amount of browns and greens. Browns are gonna be things like tree matter, dead leaves, branches, twigs, sawdust, stuff like that. Things that are typically dry. Greens are gonna be more wet stuff, grass clippings, vegetable waste, fruit scraps, coffee grounds, etc. You do not want to put any meat, dairy, or bread in your compost because those things are gonna rot and attract pests, which would be terrible. Also, it is recommended you do this outdoors. If you live in an apartment or you don't have a backyard, you can do it indoors, but it's a little bit trickier and it needs more maintenance. So for the purposes of this video, I will show you how to do it outside. First things first, you wanna select a container for your compost and place it in a grassy, relatively shady part of your yard. If you're handy, you can build a container yourself or you can just buy one from any home and garden store. Just make sure that it's the right size. You want it to fit everything that you have, but also not be too big. And you want your compost heap to be touching the ground. So make sure whatever container you use does not have a bottom on it. You'll wanna start by laying a few inches of twigs or straw at the bottom to help aerate the pile. And then you can start adding waste. The biggest rule to remember here when composting is that you want an equal balance of nitrogen, carbon, water, and air. Nitrogen is gonna be found in those green things I listed earlier, and carbon is gonna be found in the brown stuff. So equal amounts, green and brown. You'll wanna chop up any big chunks of material before you put them in, and it's also important to try to avoid any highly processed foods since those take longer to break down. But generally speaking, as long as you maintain that balance of materials, the compost will naturally begin to attract all of those organisms that eventually break it down. Once you've set everything up and added your waste, it's pretty hands-off from there. If you're going to be adding new scraps regularly, I suggest burying them in the center of the pile. That's gonna naturally aerate all of it, which is something that you wanna be doing about every week anyway. If you notice your pile is getting too dry, just water it a bit. And if it's super hot or rainy outside, you can't control the elements, it might also help to cover it with something to maintain the right balance of moisture. After a few months, your compost should be ready to use. You will know when it turns a nice dark brown color and develops an earthy smell and is warm to the touch, which is a product of all those microbes living inside. And at this point, you can go ahead and take it out and just mix the compost soil into your garden. Just remember this should be used as an additive and not the sole source of soil in your garden that could turn out very poorly. And hey, while we're on the topic of going green, BASF is currently teaming up with Discovery Digital to encourage kids to demonstrate their knowledge. Alrighty, so hopefully you found that video somewhat interesting. I don't know if any of you compost at home, but definitely a great way to reuse resources and reduce food waste. So at this point, I'll ask you again, to pause the video and brainstorm some more ways that you might be able to reduce food waste, I ask that you come up with at least one. So go ahead and pause it and take some time to do that. Alrighty, and next we are going to talk about ways of creating your own food sources. So there's a picture of me, um, very surprised looking at this giant squash that we grew on the farm. So some ways that you might be able to create your own food sources. One is a backyard garden. So creating a small fruit and vegetable garden in your backyard um, to grow fruits and vegetables for your family. Another way is potted vegetable plants. So these can be either inside or outside, maybe smaller like a tomato. Um, you might be able to grow or maybe some fresh herbs. Another way is planting fruit trees. So this works better in the South, but can be done even here in cold Ohio. Uh, planting a fruit tree that will bloom generally takes a couple years, um, but can bear fruit. Uh, fourth idea is a community garden. So I had the one of these uh, back in Ohio. So it was actually, they had plots of raised garden beds and you could kind of rent one out from the community and then plant whatever you wanted in there. So that's a really cool idea. And then this is a very innovative idea. Uh, watch a short tag talk or a piece of it. Um, cool idea called Gorilla Gardening. So let's go ahead and take a look at that.
I live in South. And I figured <laughs> this has to stop. <laughs> so, so I, I, I figured. I live in South Central. This is South Central. Liquor stores, fast food, vacant lots. So the city planners, they get together, they figure they're going to change the name South Central to make it represent something else. So they change it to South Los Angeles. Like this is going to fix what's really going wrong in the city. <laughs> this is South Los Angeles. <laughs> Liquor stores, fast food, <laughs> vacant lots. Just like 26.5 million other Americans, I live in a food desert. South Central Los Angeles, home of the drive-through and the drive-by. Funny thing is, the drive-throughs are killing more people than the drive-bys. People are dying from curable diseases in South Central Los Angeles. For instance, the obesity rate in my neighborhood is like five times higher than, say, Beverly Hills, which is like probably eight, ten miles away. I got, I got tired of, of, of seeing this happening. And I, I wonder, how would you feel if you had no access to healthy food? If every time you walk out your door, you see the ill effects that the present food system have on your neighborhood. I see, I see wheelchairs bought and sold like used cars. I see dialysis centers popping up like Starbucks. And I figured <laughs> this has to stop. <laughs> so, so I, I, I figured that the, the problem is the solution. Food is the problem, and food is the solution. Plus, I got tired of driving 45 minutes round trip to get an apple that wasn't impregnated with pesticides. So what I did, I planted a food forest in front of my house. It's on the strip of land that we call a parkway. It's like 150 feet by like 10 feet. The thing is, it's owned by the city, but you have to maintain it. So I'm like, cool. I can do whatever the hell I want. Since, I, since it's my responsibility and I got to maintain it, and this is how I decided to maintain it. So me and my group, LA Green Grounds, we got together and we started planting my food for us, fruit trees, you know, the whole nine, for vegetables. What we do, we're, we're a pay-it-forward kind of group, where it's composed of, like, gardeners from all walks of life from all over the city, and it's completely volunteer, and everything we do is free. And, and the garden, it was beautiful. And then somebody complained. The city came down on me. <laughs> and, they, and basically gave me a citation saying that I had to remove my garden, which this citation would turn into a warrant. And I'm like, come on, really? A warrant for planting food on a, on a piece of land that you could care less about? <laughs> and I was like, cool, bring it. Because this time it wasn't coming up. So LA Times got, got hold of it. Steve Lopez did a story on it and, and um, talked to the councilman. And one of the Green Grounds members, they put up a, a petition on change.org. And with 900 signatures, we were a success. We had a victory on our hands. The, my councilman even called and, uh, and said how they endorse and love what we're doing. I mean, come on, why wouldn't they? L.A. leads the United States in vacant lots that the city actually owns. They own 26 square miles of vacant lots. That's 20 central parks. That's enough space to plant 700 million, <laughs> 725 million tomato plants. Why in the hell would they not okay this? Growing one plant will give you 1,000, 10,000 seeds. Okay, when one dollar's worth of, of all righty, so hopefully you thought that was a pretty interesting video. I definitely do. I think it's a kind of a fascinating idea and definitely a clever one, kind of thinking outside the box. So there on your Google form, uh, there should be a spot to add any more ideas that you might have for creating your own food source. So hopefully you can come up with one more or two ideas of you know, something maybe a little creative or something that you already do um, to create your own food source. So you can pause the video now and go ahead and fill that out.
All right, moving on, we are going to talk about unsustainable communities before we talk about uh, the opposite. So looking at this picture here, we're going to look for some things that jump out of an unsustainable community. So one thing that jumps out to me right away is low walkability. So as you can see, these, these houses are just packed together. So if you want to go to the grocery store or walk to work or school or whatever you have, there's no way you're going to make it by walking. Biking, maybe, but even then, I mean, I can't even see any institutions um, close to these houses. Another reason is the pollution and runoff. So as you can see, there's a lot of unimpermeable surfaces. So that means water can't get through it. So for example, the concrete and asphalt and houses that take up most of the land. There's one small lake, maybe a couple um, in between the houses for the runoff, but it looks a little dirty. So another unsustainable aspect of this is loss of natural habitats. So for the most part, there's a couple trees and a uh, couple of ponds, like I said, but really there's there's no place for any natural animals to live. Uh, maybe some deer. Uh, we have a lot of deer in our neighborhood. And then finally, a lack of community. So while all these houses are very close together, it doesn't look like there's any parks or natural gathering spaces uh, for all these people to kind of meet together and build a community. So opposite of that, uh, we'll talk about some aspects of a sustainable community. So um, on the other side of not being able to walk, uh, an aspect of sustainable community would be you can walk to school or work or the store or wherever you need to go. There's limited pollution. So as you can see, kind of see in the picture, um, the factories or whatever have limited pollution. There are natural habitat areas. So parks or uh, metro parks with lots of woods or paths fewer roads and hopefully those roads can accommodate um, cyclists. And then another thing would be more local transportation. So um, city buses and things like that instead of individuals driving their car. And then uh, more of a community focus would definitely help build aspects of sustainable communities. So parks or general meeting places where people can build community. And then you can see in the picture on the right, waste reduction, water conservation, which we talked about a little bit, local food production. So buying your food from local sources and then renewable energy production for sure. And then kind of alongside with that EV, which stands for electric vehicle charging stations. And then above that, you can see green lead uh, building design. So that's just a more efficient way to design a building and then city policies that encourage sustainability. So things like uh, recycling and providing recycling bins. And we talked a little bit about public transportation and a city design for walking and rideability. If you can come up with any more aspects of sustainability, sustainable communities, feel free to write those down. Um, so now what we are going to do is we're gonna move kind of like the water diagram into designing a sustainable community. So this again can be drawn out on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. You know, you can draw a small city, draw some roads on there, um, some buildings, and then do your best to include some of the aspects that we talked about in this slide. So you can pause it on this slide if you need to look at this, um, or you can pause it on this slide so in your sustainable community, make sure to show housing, work locations or school, um, shops and the transportation system. So whether that's bikes, cars or buses or anything else. And then along with that, maybe on the bottom of your, uh, your picture or your design, explain how your design affects the energy, pollution, natural resources and the economy of the community. So maybe just a couple sent, maybe just one sentence on each one of those and kind of explain what makes your um, community so sustainable. So go ahead and pause the video here. And I look forward to seeing all of your sustainable communities. All right, so you should be able to upload that file onto the Google form and I will take a look at them. So moving on from a sustainable community 
now we are going to talk about housing needs assessment. So every uh, year, I believe the, so this is on a county basis, not a city basis, but the county and we are, the city of Dayton is in Montgomery County. So they come out with what they call a community needs assessment. And so this rather long uh, report here, I can pull up an example of it. So this one's from, yeah, a couple of years ago, um, 2014, but so this is the Montgomery County Community Needs Assessment. So as you can see, it's 99 pages long. Um, but some of the things in this document are related to sustainability. So something that they talk about in there are the birth and death rates and how those affect sufficient housing. So, and this goes along with kind of actually influenced a little bit by COVID, people moving in and out of cities so they will track those numbers and make sure they are responding with sufficient housing. So whether that's more apartments, larger houses, smaller houses or whatever they need, um, that's kind of what the community needs assessment looks at. And then also we'll talk about a little bit of how lack of housing or too much housing can influence the sustainability of a local or global area. So similar to what uh, was talked about in the TED talk, if there's too much housing or, you know, or parking lots or whatever, that was what they used in the video, um, it can cause kind of a lot of dilapidated buildings and places for crime and things like that. And then, so that's too much housing. And then a lack of housing can, um, you know, stifle the growth of your community or it can lead to a lot of homelessness in surrounding areas. So uh, that's kind of the community needs assessment and housing needs assessment um, for Montgomery County and kind of how that housing affects the sustainability of the community. So uh, that's pretty much all I have for you for this session. Hopefully you learned some things and maybe even enjoyed it a little bit. So before we meet next time, there's a couple things that I'm going to ask you to do. So um, these things, there's no spot on the Google form. They will be uh, at the very beginning of the next Google form for the next video. So um, these things uh, you can do in a couple of days, maybe just um, a couple evenings or maybe even one. So the first thing is have, uh, well, all this can be done in one big family meeting. So. First thing you'll do is ask your family members, similar to what you did, to write down what they think sustainability means. And be sure to take notes on what they say. So maybe your mom or dad has an idea or your brothers. And so write down what they think sustainability means, just a sentence or two. And then secondly, discuss and develop a plan to reduce your family's water usage and food waste. So you came up with some ideas on your own on the Google form of ways that you can reduce your family's water usage and food waste. So go ahead and maybe your family has some other ideas as well. So develop a, a plan. So maybe a couple ideas and then how are you going to execute that? And then also to aid in your discussion, if past water bills are available, uh, you may examine a few. So this is cool. I don't know if any of you have ever looked at your water bills, but it's really kind of interesting to see um, comparing month to month to see how much water you used and maybe brainstorm with your family. Oh, why was our water bill higher in June than January? And see if you come up, can come up with some ideas of that. And then finally, um, as a family, ch choose three ways to help reduce your consumption and food waste and try those ideas out for a month. Or, and then next time we meet, we'll talk about how that's going. And if any of your ideas are panning out or or maybe why they aren't. So that's all I have for you for this. Um, you can pause the video here, write this down, or take a picture, take a screenshot, whatever you need. Um, and then when we talk next time, when we do the next video, I'll have you uh, write these down at the beginning of the form. So thanks for listening and taking notes, and I will see you next time.